like to welcome you all to a presentation of the National Arts Club Architecture Committee. Throughout the year, we offer programs monthly on a great many aspects of architecture. And this summer in particular, we'll be continuing programming throughout the summer due to the unusual nature of the pandemic. Normally, the National Arts Club is closed for July and August, but this summer we'll be continuing programming straight through to the fall. Be sure to look for our upcoming programs. Tonight, I'd like to give a special thanks to Roderick Thompson of the Architecture Committee for arranging this program about Sir Edwin Lucian's A Master of Diverse Styles and Notable Architecture. After becoming well known for his arts and crafts country homes, Sir Edwin Lucian's expanded his creativity to include designs with roots in Georgian, Tudor, and even Art Nouveau eventually coming to see classicism as the ultimate change for an architect. His various commissions consisted not only of residential, commercial, academic, and government buildings, but also churches, exhibition buildings, bridges, planned developments, furniture, and garden designs. In the years leading up to the First World War, Lucians became involved with the planning for New Delhi, India, and the design for the Viceroy's House, which became his focus during the war. Post-war, he became known for his work with the Imperial War Graves Commission, designing evocative memorials that reflect his mastery of classical proportion. His work impacted not only a grieving nation recovering from war, but also comforted many of his clients who commissioned memorials for sons and close family members lost in the war. This talk will offer an introduction and overview of Sir Edward Lucian's with particular attention to his memorials. Stripped of all but the most meaningful ornament, yet retaining a connection with human proportions, these memorials serve as a beacon pointing the way towards a modern classicism as envisioned by Lucian's. Dr. Robin Prater is an architectural historian and registered professional civil engineer. A key member of the group that founded the Lucian's Trust America, she currently serves as their executive director. Dr. Prater holds a PhD in architecture from Georgia Institute of Technology, Georgia Tech, as well as a bachelor and master's degrees in civil engineering. Her diverse background includes designing in environments as diverse as offshore oil platforms and coal preparation plants, as well as teaching at East Tennessee State University, Gwinnett Technical College, and Georgia Institute of Technology. Her dissertation was on the Neo-Georgian architecture of Sir Edward Lucian's. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Robin H. Prater. Robin? Yes, thank you. Uh, given, given the current circumstances, we're all looking back fondly on 2019. And that year marked several important anniversaries for Edmund Lutyens. March 29th was the 150th anniversary of his birth, and January 1st marks 75 years since his death. In addition, the Cenotaph was erected as a temporary memorial for the peace celebrations of 1919, 100 years ago last November. Thank you to the National Arts Club for inviting me to give this talk. The Roman architectural writer Vitruvius decreed that good architecture must have three essential components, strength, functionality, and beauty. The element of beauty, some would say the artistic component of architecture is present to a greater or lesser degree, depending on the skill of the architect and the requirements of the project. I'm gonna to talk to you today about Lechen's memorials because I believe they demonstrate the architect working almost as an artist. Yes, the memorials function for their purpose and yes, they stand strong, but the emotional response they evoke is pure art, form and propor proportion, distilled architecture. But first I'd like to take a few moments to introduce or reintroduce you to Sir Edmund Lutyens. He was born in 1969, just as the American Civil War was winding down, came to adult head to, during the Edwardian era in England and died in 1944 at the end of the, of the uh, Second World War. This is Lechen's caricature of himself, a balding man with prominent glasses, a pipe sprouting out of his bushy, bushy mustache and a, and a body rounder than it once was. You can see he didn't take himself too seriously. 
And this is the formal Sir Edwin Lutyens, first president of the Institute of Registered Architects, master in the Art Workers Guild, and president of the Royal Academy. He was knighted for his work in New Delhi and for his services for the War Graves Commission and was the first architect to be awarded the Order of Merit by the Sovereign. In addition, he was a recipient of the gold medal from both the Royal Institute of British Architects and the American Institute of Architects. Then there's the man, Edwin Lutyens, known to his family and friends as Ned or Lut, extremely shy. He covered his shyness with jokes and puns, once apologizing to Lady Hardage, wife of the Indian Viceroy, over some detail of work. The balding architect wrote, I will wash your feet with my tears and dry them with my hair. True, I have very little hair, but you have very little feet. He was forgiven. His daughter Mary told this story about Lutyen's investiture at the palace when he received his knighthood in 1918. Very nervous man next to him asked what the procedure was. Quite simple, father told him. The Lord Chamberlain will call out your name and lead you up to the throne. Then all you have to do is go down on one knee on the cushion and sing, God save the king. But I don't even know the words. Don't worry, the king will help you out with them. Legends hated public speaking, but loved a good dinner party. Sir Osbert Sitwell, an observer and author on British life, described him as a singular and delightful man with an expression of mischievous benevolence in his very large blue reflective eyes. His friend E.B. Lucas speculated that Shakespeare must have been very like Lutyens. Now, that surprised you, didn't it? Lutyens felt that both men possessed a, a genius, quality of genius, tempered by an inner innocence, describing Lutyens as an eternal child, an apostle of beauty and thoroughness, his mind electrically instant. And this is the man known to, to his office, a man thoroughly and completely absorbed with architecture. He was deeply serious about his work, at all times carrying a small pad of paper to make quick sketches of ideas. He designed in trains and taxis and often during a meal. His working hours were the stuff of legend. He was at times shy, even with his staff, preferring to look over their work at night and leaving notes for them to find the next morning. Lutyen's distinguished colleague, Sir Hubert Worthington reminisced, we reveled in the flashing wit of the man, his creative flair, his unfailing imagination. He could memorize anything and his capacity for work was terrific. Once when I was given a lift home by him about midnight, I asked him, is the rumor true that you have a drawing board rigged up over your bath? He said, not exactly. I use the children's slates. True dedication. Lutyen's architecture is as varied and even more fascinating than his personality. Carl Loban's Capriccio Metienda Vivendum details 149 of Lutyen's more well-known works, all drawn at the same scale for comparison. Lutyen's actual production was much greater with over 800 works to his name, varying in scope from a small altar cross at Hampton Court to large scale monumental works. Lutyen's first became known for his arts and crafts architecture. Although he began work in the office of London architect Ernest George, Lutyen soon struck his own, designing numerous commissions in Surrey, an area known to him since boyhood. These early commissions, like Crooksbury, show the influence of Philip Webb and Richard Norman Shaw. And this was the first building of any size and importance that Lutyen got a commission for. Lutyen's returned to this house and worked on it three times. First time was the Surrey vernacular I just showed you. The second was an early Neo-Georgian uh, edition that nearly doubled the size of the house. And the third, seen here, a new owner hired Lutyen's to come back and cover up the Neo-Georgian with a vernacular facade. He decided not to come back to the house after that. 
Lutyens was asked, often asked to renovate and add on to existing house, houses or farmhouses, and Ruckman's was the first of this type of commission. Roderick Gradage considered uh, Lutch, Ruckman's to be one of the first houses that shows the true Lutyens style. The garden facade is deceptively simple. A close look reveals that each gable steps forward just enough to create three separate bays. The ground floor drops back to create a veranda. Notice the treatment of the windows. They differ on each floor. On the top floor, the side strip of windows wraps around the sides, while on the center bay, the windows remain in the plane of the wall. And then this treatment is exactly reversed on the middle layer. In the front, this is the front of Ruckman's. Lutyens was hired to come back later and add a music room, which you see on the left. And this is also typical of Lutyens that he did not like to design an addition that came years later in the same style as the original. So this is very different than what his original work was. A chance meeting at a tea party with British horticulturist Gertrude Jekyll led to a decades-long collaboration. Jekyll in her late 40s, when she first met the 20-something-year-old architect, introduced Lutyens to the theories of the arts and crafts movement. The importance of local materials, hand craftsmanship, and fidelity of place. Lutyens designed Munstead wood for Jekyll to match the garden she had already begun planting on the site. Lutyens and Jekyll worked closely together to craft a setting for this house. It's meant to unfold before your eyes as you walk up to the house from the lane on the pathway between the trees. Jekyll wrote, my house is approached by a footpath from a quiet, shady lane. There's no driving road to the front door. I like the approach to the house to be quiet and modest as possible. Lutyens learned from Jekyll Almost without fail, his houses have an interesting approach and an unexpected twist. At Munstead, the center here, what appears to be the front door, placed squarely between the two gables, is in fact not the front door. The main door is hidden over here under this encompassing entrance porch, which I'll show you here. Lutyens and Jekyll took rides around the countryside in her pony trap absorbing the local vernacular and discussing what Jekyll envisioned her house would look like. Local materials, this is the back of Lundstedt, local materials were used to build the house, Bargate stone and oak beams. In one of her many books, Jekyll wrote about the comfort of knowing the oak beams at Munstead were from trees familiar to her since childhood. She called them old friends. There is an actual living interest in knowing where the trees one house has built really grew. The three great beams, 10 inches square that stretch across the ceiling of the sitting room and do other work besides and bear up a good part of the bedroom space above, 28, they're 28 feet long, were growing 15 years ago, a mile and a half away from the house. Typically, the arts and crafts houses are asymmetric, rambling cottages with deeply pitched encompassing roofs and myriad towering chimneys. The back or the sides of the house will be oriented to the garden as you see here at Munstead. This description could also be applied to Goddard's, although the guard, on this garden side view, we see that this is Lutyens' first experiment with symmetry in a house. If you look closely, it's not exact symmetry. The door is over here to the right of center and the windows on either side don't exactly match. He changed the size depending on whether it's a north or a south orientation. This house was designed for Sir Frederick Merrilies, whose idea was to provide a place for single women working in the city. He described them as ladies of small means to go on a holiday rest. This is the common room but that sits between the two rooms, wings. Um, notice, notice the play that Lutyens put into the brickwork over the fireplace. The keystone appears to flare out and support the floor above. This is one of three fireplaces on this floor and this is by far the smallest. Lutyens also designed a wonderful Skittles alley for the ladies. It was put in for the ladies but it's still in use today with the original balls that they used. 
It's a wonderful space. In, 20, uh, in 1910, Merrilees decided to give the house to his son and his wife. So Lutchens was hired to extend the wings. So he added, um, of this butterfly plan, he added a dining room, a library, and two bedrooms, along with central heating. The garden is always designed, considered in the design of these houses, as you can see from this early plan. Lutchens often worked with Gertrude Jico as he did at this house. Even in this relatively small garden, everything is designed to relate to the geometry of the house. And we'll see that in further studies. This is the garden area that we just saw on the plan. This roofing here is kind of distinctive and, it, and it's a good example of Lutchens looking at vernacular ideas. Uh, in the area that, of, of Surrey, it was often that you would do your original roof with these Horsham slate, uh, slates. And then when you needed to re-roof, you come back over it with tile. So this was done this way originally to look like it had kind of evolved and had an age to it. One of the things that sets Lutchens apart is his planning and the way in which he related his architecture to the site. These carry through to all aspects of his designs, as does his appreciation of fine craftsmanship and material. Alan Greenberg describes the entrance facade at Tigman Court as one of Lutchen's most original and magical creations. There's a sculptural quality to this, to this work. The client, Edgar Horn, admired Lutchen's work and hired him with the expectation that the result would be extraordinary. I think he succeeded. The local material, source material, is striking. You've got thin, small bargate stones with flint galata, uh, galata joints, little tiny beads of flint embedded in the mortar between the courses. And then they combine that with small brick coins and thin horizontal bands of tile. Contrast, um, let me show you one more thing. Contrast is provided on this facade by the classical pillars and the entablature of the, of the entrance porch. That's kind of a surprise after the vernacular forms or the rest of the facade. And then once you go inside the house, the plan is oriented to bring the visitor along a pathway that eventually leads to the unfolding of the garden view. Both Lutchens and Jekyll felt that the introduction to a house should be quiet, so the plantings at the entrance are typically subdued and they reserve their statement for the garden. This is the garden facade contrasted to the, to the symmetry of the entrance. So this is not symmetrical. You've got an asymmetry. Um, you've got this, this elevation once faced a beautiful Lutchens garden. Lutchens never copies. He's inspired by precedent, he's, uh, but he always takes it in a different direction. He advances the form and often adds his own form of architectural wit. That's on full display here at Homewood. This is, this is designed for his mother-in-law as a dower house. The entrance facade has three gables. It juxtaposes a very vernacular detailing with this classical door surround that fronts a hallway. You've got a horizontal lintel here that just appears to float in space. And the expectation would be that you would have a door here or right behind here at the end of the hallway. When you go down this hallway, you find that that is not in fact the door to the main house. That door is off to your right. And that begins, that's the beginning of a very intricate and unexpected flow through this house. The garden view is equally unexpected. It opens up the dining room to airy views of the garden. These three windows are the dining room and it's a beautiful view. There's two ways to look at this. You can say this is a classical house that has been encased by a vernacular house, or you could say it's alternatively, it's a classical house emerging from a vernacular. You can make up your own mind. This is Marsh Court. It's constructed of local materials, white chalk, black flint, and red brick. Um, almost all of Lutchen's designs are still in use, either as a private residence, a hotel, flats, or as a school. The only major work that's been torn down was Papillon Hall, and the rumor was that it was haunted. The names, other names famous among, for, among Lutchen's enthusiasts include Folly Farm, Orchards, Deanery Gardens, and many others. I can't show you all tonight. 
Uh, Lutyens continued to design using his arts and crafts vernacular style throughout his career. And to many, this is what he's known for. But as his practice grew, he developed a wide range of architectural forms. Le Bois de Montier shows Lutyens experimenting with an art nouveau, possibly in, a, in the vein of the Glasgow School and, and Charles Rennie Mackintosh, but he's marrying it to uh, arts and crafts principles. This is the back view of the house across the gardens. Uh, he wrote to Emily in a letter that this was in France and he had trouble communicating. So he said, at one point, we all went down on our knees and drew pictures on the floor. We managed to get the house built. This is Grey Walls up in Scotland. Uh, it was built because a new fad came along around the turn of the century called golf. And Grey Wall sits right next to the Muirfields Golf Course. It was built as a weekend home. The uh, Mrs. Littleton, the owner, told Lushen she wanted a large a house with large windows, but she also wanted it to look like a fortress, look like it could withstand a siege. Lushen explained to her in several letters the difficulty of a fortress with lots of windows, but somehow he managed to come up with the desired results. The use of materials reflects Lutyens' respect for place. The stone here is very different than you would find in Surrey. The symmetry of this front entrance belies this asymmetry of the interior plan, which is designed to bring the visitor on a journey through the house to reveal the garden beyond. The many guest rooms, which are in the, a wing off to the left, not visible here, overlook a stunning view of the golf course at Muirfield and the Firth of Forth beyond. The approach to the house is on an angle, uh, kind of a diagonal, and it makes the house look, uh, look bigger. As you can see here, the approach plantings are fairly subdued. And then we get to the garden in the rear, which is anything but subdued, and this is only a portion of it. It's, it's stunning. Now you might think from what I've said so far that Lutyens only designed in the countryside. And this is where he first built his practice. But as his reputation grew, he began to receive commercial and institutional commissions as well. Rambling asymmetrical arts and crafts forms don't really fit well into crowded urban streets, but the symmetry and order of the Georgian or Neo-Georgian form adapts quite well. This is the Country Life Building. It's one of Lutyens' first urban commissions and one of the early examples of what he called his Renaissance style, that's with a W, it's an interpretation and extension of the architecture of Christopher Wren, such as at Hampton Court Palace. Hudson, Edward Hudson was the uh, Country Life editor, and he became very important to Lutyens. Not only was he a family friend, but he commissioned Lutyens to design three different, very important homes for him over the course of his lifetime. In addition, Country Life published numerous articles about Lutyens' uh, commissions and work, and really, uh, promoted his career, increased his visibility, and his reputation as an architect of merit, someone to be desired. Shortly after the commission for the Country Life Building, Lutyens was commissioned to design the central square of the Hampstead Garden suburb. This is the Institute, which sits on one side of the square. It's another example of Lutyens working in his Renaissance style. There's a complexity to this facade. It's emphasized by the colors in the brickwork, the implied pilasters, oversized keystones. It's really a huge exercise in mannerism. Lutyens also designed two churches for the other ends of the squares, as well as several residents in the Hampstead Garden suburb. At the same time Lutyens was working on, um, in his Renaissance form, he also began to develop a stripped down Neo-Georgian I call it his Stuart traditional. This is illustrated here. Today, this is the Bloomsbury Hotel in London, but it was built as the YWCA Central Club. And I have always appreciated that Lutyens designed an impressive entrance for these women, even going so far as to design a crest above the door for the YWCA. Neo-Georgian was not reserved strictly for the city. This, this is actually one of my favorite Lutyens buildings. Each elevation is slightly different in proportions and in fenestration. And you can see here, there's even a vernacular wing off to, off to the side. 
Shortly after the turn of the century, Lutyens began to consider what he called the high game of architecture, classicism. Heathcote was his first major experience, experiment with classical or Renaissance design in the vein of Palladio or San Nicolai. Like Le Bois de Montier, it's a bit of a one-off. Uh, here we see him playing in a massive way with the Doric order, and he's creating a pan-tiled roof villa in the middle of Yorkshire, England. So it's very interesting. Commercial examples of his classical work include Britannic House. This is in Finsbury Circle in London. It was originally the headquarters for the Anglo-Persian oil company, now BP. I believe it's been renamed Lechen's House. But if you look at it closely, it's actually a low building with a temple on the top of it. The Midland Bank Poultry was another major commission. This was their headquarters for the bank. It's now a luxury hotel in London. It's beautifully detailed. Here's an example of Lutyens' humor. Since it was the Midland Bank poultry on the corners, he put in sculptures or statues of a little boy holding a goose. So you'd know it was poultry, I guess. The detailing on the interior is beautiful. This is um, all original from the time it was used with the bank. And this is the back stairs of the Ned. Lutyens was a perfectionist when it came to design. When one of his assistants complained that he was fussing unnecessarily about a detail that nobody would ever see, Lutyens' reply was simple, God will. The universal perspective was what mattered. And we see this again on the Reuters building. This is on Fleet Street, which at the time was the location of all the major uh, newspapers and journalistic endeavors. This looks like there's a slant to the walls and you think, oh, what a funny photograph. But actually, Lutyens did put a batter on this particular building and on several other of his higher rise buildings. The proportions of the walls of the windows also get smaller slightly as you go up. And the idea was to make the building look taller than it actually was. Lutyens did things like that with his residential designs as well. Even when the Country Life uh, photographers photographed the houses, they did it from a worm's eye view, which makes the houses look grander. In the years leading up to the First World War, Lutyens became involved with the planning for New Delhi, England, and the design for the Viceroy's house became his focus during the war. Lutyens also designed the gardens for the, for the Viceroy's house, the Jaipur Column, and numerous other buildings in New Delhi, as well as helping to design the layout for New Delhi. A disagreement over the approach to the complex led to a rift between <coughs> Hubert, uh, Herbert Baker and Lutyens, who had been lifelong friends. Today, the Viceroy's house is now known as Avashtapati Bhavan. Lutyens designed not only in England, Scotland, Wales, and Ireland, but also in France, Belgium, Hungary, Italy, India, Spain, South Africa, and the United States, as well as memorials in several other countries. Lutyen's only built work in the United States is the British Embassy in Washington, D.C. This is the, in some interior views. Although Lutyen's submitted designs to Edward H. Harriman for a proposed house on the Hudson River, an American architect got the job. Career in Hastings built Arden House. Lutyens did design a small memorial in Woodlawn Cemetery for James K. Hackett, a famous, a famous actor. Lutyens' fine, uh, fine, final great work was to have been the Liverpool Metropolitan Cathedral. At 530 feet long, the cathedral would have been larger than any other in England, with a dome larger than St. Peter's in Rome. The plans were virtually complete upon his death in 1944 the drawings said to have been surrounding his bed. Although the foundation stone was laid in 1933, the design ultimately proved to be too ambitious for the church in Liverpool. When the Second World War erupted, the partially completed crypt served as an air raid shelter, and by the late 1950s, the project was abandoned. Now I've shown you <clears throat> primarily residential, commercial, and government buildings, but Lutyen's work includes included a wide variety of other types of commissions, 
like this free, uh, free church in the Hampstead Garden suburb, uh, and also St. Jude on the Hill, which sits at the other end of the central square there. Let's just design several exhibition buildings, an example of which is the British School at Rome, which was originally a temporary building that became permanent. Let's just design several bridges. This is his bridge near Hampton Court Palace. He also designed the lamp standards here. And when Lutyens took his very first airplane ride, someone flew him over Hampton Court and this bridge and he wrote to his wife my bridge from the air looks ever so much better than any other so he must have been pleased Lutyens designed numerous gardens this is Hestercombe a garden he designed with Gertrude Jekyll as he did many of his gardens and in some circles he's best known for his iconic Lutyens bench this is only one of numerous furniture and lighting designs that Lutyens did for his clients um, his favorite chair was a Napoleon chair. It had one arm that's lower than the other so you could hitch your leg up on it and sit back and read. But you needed a pair so that you could switch sides. But they're very comfortable. He also had something he called his spider back chairs. He designed a piano, he designed tables, side tables, lighting. He has some beautiful lights and he has some very whimsical lights like for nurseries that are, that are just great. You might be surprised to know that Lutyens designed the fountains at Trafalgar Square, which I always think is interesting because the lions were done by his godfather, Landseer. That's why Lutyens' middle name is Landseer. Lutyens also designed the lamp standards outside of St. Paul's, as well as the original stage sets for Peter Pan. One of his most unusual requests was to design a scale model doll's house for Queen Mary with furniture, lighting, working lighting, working plumbing, a garden designed by Gertrude Jekyll, a library of tiny books such as Rudyard Kipling, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, and G.K. Chesterton, and they didn't just sign them, they actually wrote in the books, something from these books. And you can see here they also had model cars, and anything you could possibly imagine they did. Now, these types of commissions illustrate the mainstream of Lutyens' practice. Two others show Lutyens and his clients operating almost on the edge of whimsy. At, Linus, at Lindisfarne Castle, Lutyens took a former defensive fortress and turned it into a domestic setting. Home for Lutyens was always about refuge, with necessary components of security, strength, and a sense of enclosure. What a challenge to make that in this location. The challenge was given to Lutyens by Edward Hudson. This is one of his three houses that he asked Lutyens to do. And this is also where Lutyens was able to meet the future George the First, George V, while he was still Prince of Wales. And that became useful when he came to Balmoral to tell him about his plans for Delhi. This is Castle Drogo. It was started. Bear with us just a moment, folks, while we unfreeze Robin. It looks like we're going to have to wait for her to rejoin the cast. 
And I assume she's doing that now. Sorry, I don't know. It just the Zoom went away on me, guys. Welcome back. Thank you. Can you see my screen or do I need to share again? Share again, please. Okay. There we go. Okay, so Castle Drogo was started at the started and ended at the same time as New Delhi. The blend of romanticism, drama, and domesticity at Lindisfarne would have served as the perfect resume to prove Lutyens as precisely the right architect to design the last castle in Britain. There are architectural connections here with Delhi and with many other Lutyens designs. The building is, as built, is half the size that was originally intended. Julius Drew, the client's eldest son, died in the First World War, and the heart went out of him for this building. Which brings us to Lutyens Memorials. After the end of the First World War, Lutyens designed numerous memorials and cemeteries for the government, as well as many private memorials for the sons of friends, relatives, and clients that did not return from the battlefield. The Memorial for the Missing to the Somme and the Australian National Memorial are just two of the thousand or more memorials and cemeteries designed by Lutyens. Even before the war was over, Lutyens was consulted about the need for cemeteries and memorials that properly honored the fallen soldiers. This task was initially taken over by the Red Cross until the War Office in London assumed responsibility in 1915. In May of 1917, the Imperial War Graves Commission was created and took on the task of caring for the graves of any who died while in active service from any of the Dominions. In June of 1917, Lutyens visited France with Fabian Ware, who was charged with heading up the efforts for the Imperial War Graves Commission. He also went with Herbert Baker and Charles Atkin, who was the director of the Tate Gallery. Although they were not allowed on the front lines, they saw plenty of evidence of the war in the burned out buildings, ruined tanks, and spent gun cartridges. Lutyens was touched by the poppies growing voluntarily among the temporary cemeteries and field burials. Writing to his wife, Emily, what humanity can endure and suffer is beyond belief. The battlefields, the obliteration of all human endeavor and achievement, and the human achievement of destruction is bettered by the poppies and wildflowers that are as friendly to an unexploded shell as they are to the leg of a garden seat in, in Surrey. Early on, Lutyens began to envision a non-denominational monument that would stand in each cemetery. His first thought was of a solid bronze ball, and that evolved to become what became known as the War Stone. His idea was on, it would be on a platform platforms made of not less than three steps, the upper and lower steps of the width, twice that of the center step, to give due dignity. Place one great stone of fine proportion, 12 feet long, set fair and finely wrought, and without undue ornament, and tricky or and elaborate carvings, and inscribe thereon one thought in clear letters so that all men for all time may read and know the reason why these stones are so placed throughout France. They will face the West and facing the men who lie looking ever eastward toward the enemy. The inscription, their name liveth forevermore, was part of a phrase suggested by Rudyard Kipling, taken from the book of, of Ecclesiasticus. In the same letter, Lutyens wrote of the need for buildings and cloisters varied according to the site. Every grave enclosure should be made for permanence and to have one covered permanent building wherein a roll of honor 
may be kept indelible. Lutyens also argued that all the, um, there should be uniformity and equality for every grave. The headstones should not be of unique pattern. You shouldn't be bigger for the, for the officers that everyone served equally. Lutyens' idea for an altar was controversial. His longtime friend and, and adversary, Herbert Baker, argued for a cross marking every cemetery. Perhaps having learned lessons from Delhi, Lutyens quickly began canvassing for support. His feeling was that the cross was specifically a specifically Christian symbol, whereas the abstract shape of the great stone was essentially spiritual, irrespective of creed or caste. In the end, a compromise was reached with the cabinet, deciding that Lutyens' stone of remembrance be included in all cemeteries Baker's great cross of sacrifice would additionally be placed in Christian cemeteries with other religious symbols included as appropriate. Although the war stone appears deceptively simple, it has a vitality and a force unexpected out of stone. Lutyens worked out an intricate system of optical corrections or intasis, perhaps inspired by the complex geometry of the Greek Parthenon. All the horizontal surfaces and planes are spherical, part of parallel spheres, 1,801 feet and eight inches in diameter, and vertical lines converge upward to a point at the same distance. This particular war stone sits at the memorial to the missing of the stone. Some of the adjectives to describe this, vast, complex, awesome, Gavin Stamp described it as arguably the greatest work of British architecture in the last murderous century. Lutyens had an amazing ability to think three-dimensionally. It's a rare gift for anyone, even an architect. In this case, he envisioned intersecting and connecting a series of triumphal arches. The arches build from the base with four different heights, from the lowest to the highest. The top of the keystone of each arch marks the springing point of the next arch, and it builds upward. The memorial rises 140 feet of brick and stone. The 16 pillars at the base form a canvas large enough to carve all the required names. This memorial commemorates over 72,000 of the missing after the battle battles in the Somme, men whose remains were never identified. Even today, I found they're still finding remains and when they identify them, the name is taken off the wall and the remains are buried elsewhere. The laurel wreaths on the, on the memorial give you the names of the different battles that took place in the Somme Valley. Let his war memorials show his ability to strip down the elements of classical architecture to the bare bones. Proportions are there, but in a very different and modern way. Among Lutyens' war memorials, the Cenotaph is one that holds a special place in the heart of Britain. It stands solitary and evocatively in Westminster. In the center of the pavement, in front of the Foreign Office, around the corner from Westminster Abbey, and down the street from Parliament. It has become the focus for memorial ceremonies remembering not just the First World War, but every war or conflict since. If you happen to run into a Londoner that doesn't know the name Lutyens, tell him he's the designer of the Cenotaph, and they'll nod their understanding of his impact. When the armistice was declared at the end of the First World War, Britain needed to mark the end of the fighting. But how do you celebrate a victory so devastating and so costly of lives? While the terms of the formal peace treaty were being worked out, a peace celebration committee was formed under Lord Curzon, meeting for the first time on May 9th, 1919. Lutyens was invited to number 10 Downing Street where the Prime Minister Lloyd George gave him the commission to design a non-denominational cattle fog. Although famously, the Lutyens sketches of the Cenotaph appeared almost instantaneously upon request, the architect had been pondering just such a memorial since his travels to the battlefield in France in 1917 as a member of the War Graves Commission. 
reaching back to his memories of a young man visiting Gertrude Jekyll's garden. He remembered a single slab seat under a birch tree that was christened the Cenotaph of Sigismunda by Jekyll's friend, Charles Lydell, librarian at the British Museum. Luchin suggested to Lloyd George that a cenotaph, rather than a catalog, was what was needed. Cenotaph meaning empty tomb, as opposed to a catalog, which is a raised platform to hold a casket. The cenotaph, as it emerged from the pencil of Luchin's, was the distillation of a lifetime of design, the refinement of classical Western architectural tradition into an abstracted, stripped down statement of emotion. On July 14, 1919, a parade of 15,000 soldiers and 1,500 officers marched past the newly unveiled cenotaph on their way to be reviewed by the king outside Buckingham Palace. As soon as the troops passed by, queues began to form as people stepped forward to lay flowers and wreaths at the base of the cenotaph. Lutyens was not invited to the ceremony. The memorial struck an immediate chord with the British people and calls quickly went out to make a permanent cenotaph. In the days before social media, it was a blank canvas on which people could project their own particular thoughts and with its combination of simplicity, elegance, and lack of triumphalism, the British took it immediately into their hearts. After numerous newspaper and journal articles and debates within the halls of parliament, a cabinet level decision was made to erect a permanent replacement for the cenotaph. This decision allowed Lutyens the luxury of refining his design. The temporary cenotaph consisted of a 35 foot high memorial with a chest tomb atop a rectangular pylon that featured a number of subtle setbacks throughout its height. Ornamentation was limited to three wreaths, one on each end and one at the top, and six flags on poles, three on each side. For the permanent memorial, Lutyens explored the idea of stone flags and wreaths carved of green bird eyed, neither of which came to fruition. Although Lutyens did use stone flags on other war memorials. The most important change was the use of intasis. The horizontal surfaces were designed of arcs as arcs of a circle that would meet um, at a center 900 feet below ground level while the vertical surfaces tapered so that it would meet a thousand feet above the earth if extended. The calculations for this took up 33 pages of manuscript paper and templates had to be cut for every surface. Makes you appreciate computers, doesn't it? The mortar joints are the thinnest possible at no more than 1 16th of an inch. Armistice for the First World War was on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, November 1918. The permanent cenotaph was unveiled by the king at 11 a.m. on November 11, 1920, in conjunction with a ceremony to inter the body of an unknown warrior from the Western Front in the sacred precincts of Westminster Abbey. Public reaction was overwhelming. Over a million people filed past within the next five days and over 100,000 wreaths were laid. Compare this to the 320,000 people that filed past Churchill's coffin in the three days his body lay in state. Lutyens' friend, author J.M. Barry, wrote to Lutyens that the cenotaph grows in beauty as one strolls down alone or nights to look at it, which becomes my habit. I stand cogitating why and how it is so noble a thing. It is how the war has moved you and lifted you above yourself. Thank you for allowing me to share some of my reasons, some of the reasons I find Sir Edwin Lutyens and his architecture so fascinating, and in the case of his memorial, so moving. Thank you, thank you, Robin. And uh, now Dr. Prater will take some questions. And uh, I ask you to please uh, type them into chat and I'll, uh, I'll read them to her. But in the meantime, uh, we do have a question from Marsha who asks if all the houses are located in Surrey or throughout the UK. 
There are a lot of the houses are in Surrey and Sussex, but they are located pretty much throughout the, the, uh, the UK, more in the south, southeast than any other area though. And there's several, a, no, a number are in London as well. Can you tell me, uh, I'm just personally curious why uh, Lutyens was not invited to the uh, first uh, ceremony of the Cenotaph? I think that nobody thought it was going to be that big a deal. Uh, I think, you know, they, uh, they took everybody by surprise. Ah. Do we have any questions from the audience? We do. Did he also design the interiors? Yes, uh, he, he designed pretty much every detail of the house from the furniture to the, uh, to some, to the interiors. He has wonderful, uh, the, the profiles on his moldings are just phenomenal. The fireplaces are very unusual. They're very um, almost modern in their uh, simplicity. And he, he did some interesting things like in Folly Farm, he did a room with black walls and um, it's simply stunning. It's a two-story room, and then there's balconies at the top with a lattice that um, overlook it, and the balconies are, are bright red. So, are, are, his, uh, are his buildings viewed favorably now in India? Yes, I believe it, by, by a lot of people. Uh, we have, as, with, as a member of the Elections Trust America, we've been doing webinars, and we've been thrilled to have a number of, of people watching from India. We had 50 at one of our last lectures, and that's with a huge oh. time difference. Ours was at noon. Uh, Hal would like to know if he designed the Cenotaph in Hong Kong. I need to look that up, but I think he did. I think He's he did. Got, he, there are several Cenotaphs in, in other locations. I'm pretty sure of that. All right. Uh, Laura would like to know if any of these houses or buildings are on the National Register. Well, in, in England, they, they, they have something slightly different, which are called listed buildings. And you can be different grade listing, but most, most of the Lutyens buildings are, are listed, almost all of them. And most at, a pre, at the highest level. They are. Are the commercial buildings open to be visited? Some of them are, some of them aren't. Um, and then there's a, once a year, they have an open London day and that's a great time to go visit. A lot of the buildings you can't get in the rest of the time. Ah, did uh, Lutyens ever use the Art Deco style? Le Bois de Montier is, is as close as he got and that's really Art Nouveau, so. Ah, uh, someone was asking if uh, you have any pictures of the furniture or decorative artifacts he designed. I don't have them on this particular lecture. I, I, the, the Legends Trust America is actually planning a webinar on, on his furniture. If you're interested, you can look on our website. Sorry, I <laughs> hope that's okay to say that. All right, uh, let me see if we have any more. Yes, we do. Um, aside from arts and crafts, you mentioned another style, uh, Le Bois Motier, what style? That's uh, Art Nouveau. Nouveau? Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, you wouldn't call Lutyens an Art Nouveau architect. He's just kind of experimenting with the style there. Uh, Ricardo wants to uh, uh, ask, uh, he says you argue that uh, Lutyens moved towards classical architecture while he's also seen as a precursor to modern architecture. Why the disparate conclusions about his work? I don't think he moved strictly to classical. I think that was just one more style that he worked in. I think he saw it as a challenge. Um, and, and when he moved toward classicism, he, he said you have to embrace the orders and make them your own. And so to my opinion, he, he studied classicism, worked in it, and, and he went to a very modern place with the way he kind of stripped it down. The modernists didn't always appreciate him. I just think he would have given us a different direction for modernism. Are the, uh, are the interiors as, uh, as uh, developed and uh, beautiful as the exteriors? Yes, maybe even more so. It's just they're mostly in private homes. So it's um, ah. the salutation well, is a hotel. It's 
or it was a hotel. It's absolutely stunning inside. Was his interest uh, in and attention to gardens unusual for the time? Well, I think it was part of the appreciation of, of the arts and craft movement that you would appreciate the, the relationship of the garden and the architecture, but he kind of took it to, and in working with Gertrude Jekyll, she was one of the fir foremost gardeners of her day. So I think that really gave him an appreciation that was unusual. Yes, I think in, in that uh, level and class of buildings around the world and in this country as well, uh, gardens accompanied homes pretty, pretty regularly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Leo uh, says that we believe the Indian government is now proposing to replace Luchin's Viceroy building with an appropriate Hindu structure. Any news on that? My understanding is that they're not, they're not talking about replacing the Viceroy's house, Rashtrapati Bhavan, that that will stay in place. It's more of the buildings that, that there's, a, there's a wonderful vista that leads to it. They're, they're talking about does, uh, replacing one of the Baker buildings, I believe, and it's it's very controversial. So I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, would you uh, would you tell our uh, our viewers your website, please? It's a uh, com. And again, would you say that again, please? Yes, Lutchens Trust America, L U T Y E N S, America. Dot com, tr excuse me, Legends Trust America dot com. Okay, and I have one final question here. Uh, that's all we have time for, unfortunately, folks. Is the Viceroy Palace used today? Absolutely. It's um, basically the equivalent of the way we use the White House here. Ah, very much in use. And I wish I could have shown you photographs of the interior. It's probably one of his most stunning works. Uh. All right, well, thank you, Dr. Robin Prater, and I thank you all for attending today. I hope you come back uh, and see some more National Arts Club programs, and Robin, I hope to meet you in person. We've never met in person, and oh, hopefully lovely. you will come to New York and come to the club and visit us again. That would be lovely. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you all, and good night. Good night.